All right. So I'll get us started tonight. Um, I first of all want to say thank you so much for everyone for coming out tonight. Um, we're very excited to have two of the top researchers within this field, um, concussion management in sports. Um, and so I'll start us off by introducing our speakers and panelists for tonight. So first up, we have Dr. Christina Master. She serves as Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also an attending at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, serving as co-director of the Minds Matter Concussion Progr Program for Pediatric and Adolescent Sports Medicine in the Division of Pediatric Orthopedics. She's also an attending at the Care Network at the Carabbit Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Master studies pediatric and adolescent concussion and identifies interventions that improve time to recovery and clinical outcomes. In particular, she is interested in visual and vestibular problems that occur after concussion that may contribute to persisting prolonged symptomatology and impaired function and the role they play as targets for active intervention. Dr. Master practices both primary care sports medicine and academic general pediatric and cares for children across the spectrum of childhood. Her work co-founding and co-leading the Minds Matter Concussion Program at TOP has been focused on improving our understanding of concussion with the goal of improving care and outcomes for children with concussion. In addition to Dr. Master, we have Dr. John Leddy. Um, he is affiliate, affiliated with the University of Buffalo and serves as the clinical professor in the Department of Orthopedics at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Science. He's an adjunct clinical professor in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Sciences and professor of Re Rehabilitation Services in the, at the University of Buffalo School of Health-Related Professions. He's the Director of Outcomes Research for Orthopedics and Medical Director of the University of Buffalo Concussion Management Clinic. As you can see, they obviously have a pretty extensive and amazing resume. So we have, like I said, two of the top. Um, and just to go on for Dr. Letty, so his goal is to provide the best evidence-based evaluation and treatment practices for patients with concussion and post-concussion syndrome. He serves as the medical director of the University of Buffalo Concussion Management Clinic. And this clinic is the first ever in the United States to use standardized treadmill testing to establish recovery from concussion and to use exercise in the rehabilitation of patients with pro prolonged concussion symptoms. His primary research interest is the investigation of the basic mechanisms um, and the disturbed physiology in concussion and how to help restore the physiology to normal, to normal and to help patients recover and safely to return to activity and to sport. So thank you guys both for being here tonight. We're very excited to have you. Um, and I will hand it off to you, Dr. Master, to start your presentation. Great, thanks so much. Um, let's see if we can get this going here. Thanks so much for having us. Um, we're very excited. We'll try and run through a little bit of how we approach a concussion um, and hopefully that will give you an, a nice um, overview and a, a way that you can incorporate that into your own emerging practice um, in your current stage in life. And so just to kind of go through, I don't really have any financial conflicts, uh, but we are fortunate to receive some funding for our research. We're gonna try and review a few of the visio-vestibular deficits and concussion, try and understand the implications of those deficits, especially in terms of how you might manage uh, patients, in particular children during their recovery. And I don't think we'll probably have time to review the um, uh, advances that we're making in objective measures because we wanna uh, be practical and have a little bit of time for conversation, but um, I have the extra slides and happy to share them at any time. You all are going to be really familiar with the fact that currently concussion diagnosis is still symptom based. Uh, you're going to be familiar with these domains um, of physical, cognitive and emotional and sleep symptoms. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that, you know, again, this could represent a concussion, uh, but they're nonspecific symptoms and it could be mono, migraine, COVID, you broke up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or maybe you're just an adolescent, right? And so um, some great work from our colleague, Grant Iverson, who examined 30,000 teenagers up in Maine, 
found that about a third of those kids who didn't have a current concussion actually had symptoms that qualified them as having persistent post-concussion symptoms. And so you can see how, while symptom-based concussion diagnosis um, and having it be directed this way is helpful, um, it's not really 100% slam dunk. And it would be nice to be able to add to that in terms of how we uh, make the diagnosis. And so we're making some progress along those lines um, in the work that's been going on over the last decade or so. In particular, um, as Jess had mentioned, uh, we're, we've been very interested in visio-vestibular signs. And I think part of what um, has um, been interesting to us is that if we don't assess these, symptom, these systems, we won't actually find these deficits. And so you don't uh, find what you don't seek. And so uh, really from this standpoint, what we're trying to get out there in terms of a message is that we really shouldn't be having the conversation with our pa patients anymore that I think you have a concussion, but your physical exam is normal, right? And so uh, there are absolutely definitely um, examinations that you can be performing that actually help you identify observable signs. And we're gonna go over that a little bit um, in a practical way in terms of how we do this and, and what they mean. And so you can see here that what we um, have incorporated into what we find to be a pretty efficient way to approach this is looking at vision and not just acuity, but particularly looking at visual function. So near point of convergence, ocular accommodation, um, and then the vestibular ocular um, aspects, horizontal and vertical saccades, the angular vestibular ocular reflex, smooth pursuit, and what we would describe as a complex tandem gait. And I'll go through each of these in a li little bit more detail, uh, both with regard to the physiology as well as just the general um, logistics of administering the exam. So smooth pursuit is a function um, that you will remember um, in your basic um, uh, physiology of vision where you use that task to essentially track a moving object. Um, it appears that we tend to be uh, better at horizontal than vertical um, and the latency to perform these um, uh, movements um, is actually very short, um, shorter than saccades, which is the next movement that we'll look at. Um, you generally need to have a visual target to initiate a uh, pursuit. And so from that standpoint, this would be something like uh, watching a bird fly through the sky or a ball flying at you, you know, in left field. And so that would be a smooth pursuit. Saccades or jump movements. And so this um, essentially um, uh, uh, encompasses a coordinated binocular vision where you're jumping quickly back and forth, whether it's horizontal, vertical, diagonal, it's used in scanning. Um, this is in contrast to smooth pursuit, which is really um, a very smooth um, activity. The saccade is actually one of the fastest movements that your human body actually performs and has um, a short latency uh, from that standpoint. Um, when it comes to um, saccades, basically this can be something that you're uh, using in terms of looking back and forth um, when you're driving, uh, when you're reading, um, and so you can see how saccades would be highly important in everyday life. The angular vestibular ocular reflex uh, is one that um, we like to describe to our kids as your body's steady cam feature. Um, and I'm actually a little bit afraid to ask how many of you actually have ever seen um, a video camera that didn't have a steady cam feature because you are all, uh, you know, uh, of the younger generation than John and myself. But you know, there used to be a day and a time where when you take a video, actually, if you didn't have a stabilizing feature in your camera, the picture would jump. And essentially, that's what happens, um, you know, in your body and what your brain does in uh, adapting and adjusting, you know, when you're running, um, your um, visual um, target actually is physically moving while you're running and your head is bouncing, but your perception of it in your brain is that it's steady. And so this is really what your vestibular system and in particular the vestibular ocular reflex um, does in terms of stabilizing um, your visual target as you're moving. And it's a reflex function, as you can see here on the slide. Um, it basically preserves the image in the center of your visual field. Um, and this is important. Um, um, both in reading, but also when you're moving. Um, and in particular, like if you're walking through three-dimensional space, um, this is important. Um, it doesn't necessarily depend on visual input, but it helps you manage your visual input um, as a sensory stimulus. The VR cancellation or the visual motion sensitivity test is actually the exact opposite then. Essentially, um, if you know when you are um, looking at an object and you're moving your head up and down and you keep it fixed, um, sometimes you actually want to move your head and your eyes in the same direction. So if every time you move your head, your eyes move in the opposite direction, that's kind of a problem You know, if you're playing sports or doing something um, like driving. And so this is a visually mediated override of the VOR. And so you need this if you're gonna move um, your head and eyes in the same direction. Um, and this is important if you're actually following a moving object. 
Convergence is the visual function that we're interested in that is a binocular function where essentially you are coordinating both eyes pretty precisely um, where they're moving in opposite directions uh, to essentially focus at something at a near distance. Um, this is really the only eye movement that you perform that is disconjugate um, in that um, they're going in opposite directions. Um, it is a complicated um, function, um, so it's not just um, the muscle movements. There's also accommodation, which contributes to convergence, which is um, how your body um, focuses each eye monocularly, um, and so your pupil uh, gets involved in this task as well. Um, and this is, generally speaking, a slower movement than saccades, and so from that standpoint, um, this um, takes a little bit more time in terms of adjusting near to far, far to near, um, and so that's convergence. In terms of what um, contributes to convergence, accommodation is the other task that we're interested in, and that it basically represents the monocular uh, con contribution to convergence. Um, this is where you have your lens shape um, adjusting, your pupil size adjusting, um, and this basically is um, contributed to by your autonomic nervous system. Um, and so from that standpoint, that becomes of interest in an interesting um, intersection of our research in visual and vestibular function and John's research um, in uh, autonomic physiology and the alterations after concussion that occur there. And then lastly, we include balance in our screen. Um, and essentially, you know, balance again is not simply a, a, a neurologic function, it's multifactorial, it's a neuromuscular, a neuromotor function. Um, and this basically assesses your vestibulospinal um, system. Uh, as opposed to your vestibular ocular system, which is what we've been focusing prior to this. And so um, it, it is, there's both central and peripheral contributions to this. Um, and you just have to remember that it's not always just a reflection of brain function or brain balance as we'll describe it to our kids, but it also um, it has contribution from peripheral core strength and other neuromuscular factors. So it's not purely a, a brain oriented test, but it is nonetheless um, a complicated task. And that's where I think the brain is involved and why it's often a deficit that you'll observe after concussion is because there's a lot of um, higher level integration of multiple sensory inputs in order to maintain balance. And so then if we're going to go over a little bit about what we do here in the office, I'm just going to show you a little bit about how we assess smooth pursuit. And you can see here that we have you know, a teenage gal who is essentially uh, tracking uh, my moving finger. Um, what we would say about that is that the slower movements uh, would be what we would consider smooth pursuit. As you get faster, um, you actually, your visual system can't move um, uh, beyond a certain speed with smooth pursuit. And once you go faster with a moving target, you actually perform what are called catch-up saccades. You probably can't see this with your naked eye, but with eye tracking, you can see that there are differences between a smooth pursuit um, and then as something moves faster uh, using catch-up saccades. Uh, but again, uh, we think that this is a really highly integrated um, function and it gets disturbing concussion. That's why we assess that. And then if you go next to assessing saccades, uh, what you'll see is that we'll um, do it in both directions, uh, horizontal and vertical. Um, you know, what's handy about this particular um, task um, and this assessment that we do with the visio vestibular examination is that you've got pretty much everything you need to be able to do this, you know, on your own. Um, and so using your fingers um, as a target, we have them uh, jump from uh, up and down or side to side. And then we inquire about symptom provocation, um, such as um, uh, headache, dizziness, nausea. Um, they may also um, demonstrate some physical signs like eyes watering or turning red, or if it's really um, too uncomfortable for them, they'll actually just simply stop performing it because um, they aren't able to perform it as they normally would if they didn't have a concussion. In terms of the vestibulo-ocular uh, reflex, this is the um, angular vestibulo-ocular reflex test that we do for gay stability in both planes, horizontal and vertical. And the same thing um, applies where we look at how they perform it as well as ask about how it makes them feel. And then the VOR cancellation or the VMS um, is performed this way, um, where essentially they um, follow their own thumb uh, moving across an arc in front of them. For the tandem gait, what we have found really helpful is that we actually use four conditions where they're walking on a um, in tandem, like they're on a tightrope or a, a balance beam, um, eyes open forward, eyes open, um, eyes closed forward, and then eyes open backwards and eyes closed backwards. 
What's nice about this um, particular task is that each um, uh, condition, as you can imagine, gets progressively nice harder. Um, and so then that eliminates a little bit of the ceiling effect that sometimes you can get by simply just looking at balance, for instance, in the SCAT-5, if you're just looking at double leg stance, single leg stance, or tandem stance. Um, in some of our more elite athletes, as you guys will recognize, um, they may have really great balance and the tasks, if they're too easy, um, won't really um, expose any deficits caused by the concussion. So this is where you need to know your um, patients well in terms of their assessment. Um, if you are performing just a double leg stance uh, for balance on a gymnast or a hockey player who's concussed, that may be normal um, because they have high level of balance to begin with. And so you need to make the task hard enough and that's really true for any assessment that you're doing in concussion. And that principle actually, you know, John will talk about in terms of the exercise testing that you have to keep increasing the level of difficulty to really essentially find a threshold where um, a deficit is essentially, um, you know, provoked or exposed. And so that's what we like about the balance test there. In assessing your point of convergence, we use um, an accommodation ruler. Um, and this ruler basically, as you can see, has centimeter markings on it. And it has a visual target that is a vertical line that is um, a 20, 30 um, a, a font. And essentially, we ask them to tell us when it uh, gets blurry and goes double. Um, when they can no longer maintain single monocular, uh, single monocular vision. Um, and then we have them uh, uh, tell us when it actually recovers, when it goes from double to single again. And those are the measures that we use to look at the binocular function. And then similarly, from the accommodation standpoint, we do the same thing uh, with the ruler and the visual target uh, with one eye covered um, and ask them uh, where the um, target becomes blurry. And that's the accommodative amplitude. And so from that standpoint, you can see then um, um, you know, these are just uh, ways in which we feel we're able to get um, at least somewhat more objective um, measures of uh, that we can actually quantify with regard to the deficits with, with concussion. Here are just some examples of some of the things that you might see if you actually look for it. This is a little guy who came and saw us in the office and he had actually seen a number of other clinicians before he saw us and he was complaining of visual issues and he kept being told that his vision was fine. And you can see that if they just really assess his visual acuity, um, he might look fine. So he saw a pediatrician, a neurologist, um, an optometrist. Um, and so again, until you know, we um, performed our examination on him that looked at binocular visual function, where you can see here, he's not really um, a, a conjugate with his um, smooth pursuit. Um, essentially, um, he was told that he had normal vision. And so that's another message we're trying to get out there is that you need to do more than just visual acuity if you're going to look at concussion and vision issues. And then this is a guy who um, basically came to us after um, uh, an injury in um, football practice. And believe it or not, he's trying to look um, vertically with um, vertical saccades. And you can see how uncoordinated he is and what trouble he's having with the vertical saccades there. Um, and so that, again, would not be readily apparent if you don't actually do the dynamic test. And then here is an example of some balance dysfunction where, again, already he's having trouble with his eyes open because he has his hands up. Um, like he's on a tightrope. Okay, backwards. And then as he gets backwards, he gets progressively worse. And this is sometimes where in the office, right, close our, your eyes. Keep our going. parents backwards. will say to us and say to the kid, Johnny, cut it out. Stop forcing around. Why are you like acting like this? Because they can't believe that their kid has such terrible balance function after a concussion. And again, same thing applies here that um, with each condition, you know, um, your visual input is often used to help you manage any problems with balance. And so while we don't recommend walking around backwards with your eyes closed in general in life, um, using it as a test is actually really helpful to see how your brain input into balance is working out because you're removing the visual compensation. And so then what do we know about this particular evaluation that we do? Um, so uh, we're really fortunate in our group that Dan Corrin is a PEDS emergency department, um, uh, train, emergency medicine trained uh, person in our department. And exam is essentially, essentially looking at our exam to see, you know, how does this, you know, perform in terms of being able to pick up, um, you know, abnormals and concussion, how many people are abnormal uh, without a concussion. And so it's interesting because these um, tasks are all developmental. Um, as you can imagine, as kids are growing up, 
um, they don't start out being able to do all these coordinated visual and vestibular functions. And so what we found was that actually, um, if you did this entire um, uh, slew of assessments, um, about 30% of kids would have one that was abnormal. And so that gives you a little bit of a context of you know, how to interpret this exam. So you're not gonna be rigidly saying any one thing and then you know, you're definitely having a concussion, a diagnosis applied to you, but that what you would look at is again, taking this in the context of, you know, there could be up to a third of kids who have an abnormal measurement. Um, but as you can see, it drops much more um, dramatically that very few had two or three abnormalities, you know, in this um, assessment, if you did it um, in totality. Um, there was pretty decent um, agreement between clinicians there, fair to moderate, so not fabulous, but with the emergency department uh, physicians, we found that there was fair to moderate. And that's actually not bad, we don't think, especially because ED doctors don't see concussions all the time, uh, like someone might, um, you know, in a concussion program or um, in a sports medicine program. We also found that you can rely reliably perform this down to 10 years of age. And so that's also useful to know. Um, we actually were able to get down to even school age kids. And to be honest with you, we will try this assessment on anyone that's above school age. And I sometimes will even try it in my preschoolers. Um, but again, to do the in, uh, exam in toto, we would say generally speaking, um, 10 years and up, um, a pretty a sure thing. Um, but even down to six years old, um, over half of them can try that. And so it's a, a useful um, task uh, to try. And and again, it's generally speaking free. You don't have to have any special equipment per se, and it can give you a lot of actionable information. We didn't find that they changed over a sports season. So that was published by um, uh, our uh, postdoc, uh, Trish Roby, um, that these are pretty stable findings and so are useful from that standpoint. Um, and then we also found that um, in terms of um, making a diagnosis in the emergency department in that acute phase in the first couple of days, if people actually did this exam, they were more likely to get a, an immediate diagnosis as opposed to you know, having that I'm not sure conversation in the ER and then ending up being diagnosed you know, a few days or even a week later with their primary care physician or otherwise. And so, um, and that's important as you can see because delayed diagnosis increased their odds of having persistent post-concussion symptoms. And so this is again, uh, a nice free, easy way to make an intervention to be able to make a diagnosis and then um, uh, uh, change your management um, as a result. And so then in terms of other um, uh, studies that our group has done in terms of looking at this to try and optimize this, um, you know, in terms of the repetitions, this is uh, this uh, uh, visual vestibular examination, the VVE is similar to uh, the vestibular oculomotor screen um, that is, um, uh, has been developed by our colleagues um, in Pittsburgh. And basically what we've done is essentially adapt it and um, uh, to our pediatric um, setting and also try to optimize it for that setting. And so in this study, what we found was that while the VOMS goes to 10 repetitions, in terms of the standardized exam. Um, we um, did a study where we looked at 10, 20, and 30 repetitions and found that um, the sensitivity um, of the tests actually improved with the increased number of repetitions. But as you know, with any kind of screening test, you may sacrifice specificity as a result. And so what we found for the optimized AUC was that if we did 20 repetition, repetitions that actually optimize your chances of catching someone um, having a concussion and not having a false negative, but not having too many false positives that um, would otherwise be in uh, kids that actually would normally have a few abnormal um, you know, findings on this exam. And so 20 repetitions is currently what we are um, recommending and performing in the office. In terms of balance, uh, we really like the study that Dan uh, did for us, um, this analysis for us, where we compared it with objective measures. Um, we've been also very interested in objective measures in our group. Um, and so we looked at the MBES, which is part of the SCAT, but then also looked at a force plate oriented measure, and that's the modified clinical test of sensory integration of balance. Um, and what was interesting is that, you know, while you can see here um, that um, our um, complex tandem gate, you know, is right there in the middle in that navy blue line on this, um, you know, AU, um, and then this uh, ROC curve, that what you find is that while, yes, the, um, you know, uh, uh, MBES might perform a little bit better um, than our tandem gait, both of them actually performed better than our, um, you know, force plate uh, measurement, which was really interesting to us and not what we'd expect. Um, and we do find that the complex tandem gait, just uh, logistically speaking, is easier to actually perform and takes less time than the MBES. And so that's sort of where we've landed in our group in terms of how we do it. And then what do we find when we look for vision problems? Like if you're just looking for visual acuity, you won't find these issues. But when we um, looked at a series of 100 kids in our um, 
concussion program, we found actually a high prevalence, um, you know, in these teenagers. Um, so they did our screening exam and at the same time as part of the study had a comprehensive optometry assessment. And what they found was that there's a high rate, as you can see, of convergence, accommodation and psychotic deficits. And then interestingly, as you can see, a lot of these kids had more than one. Um, and so then you can see how this can start to really contribute to um, difficulty and challenges after um, a concussion when they're turning back to activities. We also then did another study where we looked at the relationship between these signs and symptoms, and essentially um, using um, a Manhattan, Manhattan distance metric, looking at the um, relationship between these um, uh, signs and symptoms, we were able to define two different clusters, um, the vestibular cluster and the vision cluster. And if you um, look at this figure, just to orient you across the x-axis, you have the deficits on the visual vestibular exam. And on the y-axis, you see sort of the relationship between the clusters. And essentially um, what you see here is that there are two clusters that are defined. So yellow is the presence of these um, deficits and signs, blue is the absence, um, and the vestibular cluster um, included balance, VOR, smooth pursuit, um, and uh, you can see that um, across the top there with the psychotic deficits. Um, what was interesting was that the vision cluster um, is really across the entire middle there where um, abnormal near point of convergence accommodation were separately associated, but also appeared to uh, be a subset of the group of kids that also had vestibular. So there were some kids that had both vestibular and vision issues um, uh, and some kids who just had vestibular and those who had vision tended to also have vestibular as well. And so again, we thought that was interesting in terms of how that relationship uh, panned out from the statistical analysis. And we do see that clinically as well. And then what's useful about this then is that these vestibular signs, they predict persistent symptoms. So basically, if you had deficits in balance, VOR, smooth pursuit, um, uh, you were more likely to take a longer time to recover. Um, and that was the same with the abnormal accommodation amplitude. Um, not so much with near point of convergence in our cohort. Um, and again, that made us very interested in this whole aspect of potentially the autonomic nervous system dysfunction contributing to this. And uh, John will address that in his um, talk. And so then, you know, so what, right? Like, I mean, this is all great and very theoretical. We did a really nice, you know, overview here, 30,000 foot view of like visual physiology, but what does that matter to our kids, right? And so I think what I would say is that it actually makes a big difference in how you can help your kids recover, understand their injury and manage the symptoms. And actually a lot of education that we do in the office and the uh, clinical visit actually um, is, is huge along these lines in terms of helping them adjust and um, su uh, feel supported as they recover and also feel a little bit like they have some agency and some self-efficacy um, in terms of understanding what's going on as opposed to just being completely like bewildered as to why they're experiencing the symptoms that they're experiencing. And so really the implications um, that we would have you just remember are that smooth pursuit is, uh, if you have trouble with that, you're gonna have trouble with moving objects, ball sports and driving. If you have trouble with saccades, you're gonna have trouble with coordinated jump eye movements and horizontal saccades, you're gonna have trouble with reading and difficulty with vertical saccades will give you trouble with note taking or looking up and down at a smart board or a monitor, which is essentially what our kids are doing like all day long in school, right? With regard to angular VOR gaze stability issues, um, what we'll um, tell our kids to anticipate is that if they have trouble with horizontal VOR, um, they may have trouble with motion sickness, riding in the car or busy hallways where essentially you have um, uh, basically visual stimulus, you know, essentially flying at you horizontally all the time. If you have trouble with vertical VOR, we find that these kids have trouble with running, that actually their brain steady cam feature, since it's not functioning, they will go running to catch the bus. And because they were having uh, some bouncing there, and their uh, angular VOR wasn't functioning so well, they actually feel, you know, headachy or nauseous, like they're going to throw up after doing a little bit of running. And so those are all really helpful. And in those instances, we would tell kids to try getting some aerobic activity with a stationary bike where there's less bouncing movement as a result. And so you can see how, practically speaking, understanding a little bit of the physiology helps you actually manage your patient. The near point of convergence is really important if you're focusing it near. So really important in terms of reading, um, whether it's a tablet, a monitor, or a old fashioned you know, paper book. Um, and definitely the problems that our kids will describe when they have trouble with near point of convergence is besides double vision, um, visual fatigue with prolonged focus at near, words moving or jumping on a page and losing your place while reading or just being very slow while reading. And then accommodation, again, as you know, would contribute to having the complaint of blurry vision. 
With balance, um, we would say it's really important to remember this in particular with your kids as they're going back to sport. There's a lot of information and data that's come out in the last um, uh, few years that indicate that after concussion, besides having the balance issue, you may also have an increased risk of musculoskeletal injury. And so there may be unrecognized deficits that, you know, again, we want to make sure that kids are not just, you know, feeling okay walking around. The whole point of the return to play process is to make sure that they can tolerate uh, exertion. But then also we need to think about sport specific skills. Skills. Can they perform those at the level that they need to perform to be able to be safe? And so, again, make sure you're um, uh, checking that out in terms of uh, planning for their return to sport. And so relevant accommodations that you can give your patients if they have these deficits would be to give them extra time and untimed tasks in school. Uh, the pacing breaks, besides being cognitively oriented, would be visually oriented. Um, and then having essentially visual accommodations with pre-printed notes or using temporarily audio recorded formats versus a visual or electronic format might be helpful, in addition to enlarged font materials and extra time in the hallways. So I'm going to stop right there. This is my team. I'm so lucky to have a wonderful team. Um, we'll answer some questions um, at, at, at the end, I think will probably be the best. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. But that's basically, in a nutshell, how we try and approach, um, you know, uh, 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 diagnosing concussion with the physical examination um, in the office. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to thank um, Joan and Jessica and the uh, MISG for asking me to participate tonight and to acknowledge my, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Master, and that uh, fantastic pro uh, presentation she just made, uh, made you. Um, she's really helped me understand all about vision and vestibular problems. Um, and um, I try to emulate her examination every time I see a patient. You should too. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, prognosis and treatment. I do have some disclosures, uh, as you see there. Uh, they don't affect the content of this talk. Um, one thing um, that everyone should do when they're assessing concussion is obtain a mechanism of injury and uh, these prior um, conditions like concussions, the timing, uh, duration of recovery, uh, other medical problems, psychiatric history, all of these affect um, uh, concussion diagnosis and prognosis. What's the evidence? Uh, um, a systematic review from the Berlin Conference um, looked at the associated factors uh, and clinical recovery from sport-related concussion. Uh, back then, they said the most consistent predictor of slower recovery was the severity of the person's acute and subacute uh, symptoms, uh, particularly things like uh, headache or depression. Um, those who have a prior or a prehistory of mental health problems are certainly at greater risk for having persistent symptoms. I see this uh, a lot and um, it's something to pay attention about. If you get uh, a prehistory uh, of a pre-injury history of uh, anxiety or depression, uh, think about uh, how those uh, uh, symptoms are going to get worse and how you may want to address them if they're not improving. Um, ADHD actually appears uh, to not be associated with a substantially greater risk of being concussed. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, it seems to be associated with a, a greater risk of being concussed as opposed to pro uh, prolonged recovery, believe it or not. Um, and some evidence that the teenage years, particularly in high school, are the most vulnerable to prolonged post concussive symptoms with greater risk for girls and boys. But not all studies show that actually. Other uh, predictors of delayed recovery, um, a non-sport injury uh, mechanism like a car accident, early poor exercise tolerance, which I may talk about. And as Dr. Master showed you, the number of cervical, vestibular, and ocular motor signs, that seems to be important. So while normal kids may have one of those uh, abnormalities, if you get a kid in your office and they have five or six of them, they're likely to take longer to recover. And you might want to think about intervening earlier in that group than you would otherwise. Um, I talked about um, exercise tolerance and prognosis. And uh, if you have the ability to assess this, um, it's actually a pretty strong predictor of delayed recovery. So if you put someone on a treadmill or a bike and they stop exercising at a low heart rate, 
110, 115 or lower, uh, they're much more likely to have a delayed recovery if you're doing this assessment within a week of concussion. Now, I know everybody doesn't have uh, that capacity, but we use this sometimes, and especially we combine it with the physical examination you just heard about to try to predict who may have a fast versus a delayed recovery. And when we look at this uh, statistically, and we look at the contrib contribution to the variance in recovery over time, um, those ones who had a low heart rate threshold, uh, and in this study was less than 135 beats per minute where they had to stop, were much more likely to have a delayed recovery than those who had a, a higher threshold. And the difference in recovery was, was pretty profound, um, about two weeks versus two months. So again, this is only one study, but it was a randomized trial. And um, it's just informative. Exercise tolerance is a pretty sensitive indicator of concussion and can help you um, in, in, in helping to establish prognosis. Um, the other thing we've combined um, in this vein of doing sort of physiological testing, and, and this uh, uh, dovetails nicely with Dr. Masters' talk about uh, vision testing. The KD test is a test of um, uh, naming numbers uh, uh, and it's a time test. And, and basically what we did in this study is we gave the test before they did the treadmill test and then repeated it after the treadmill test. So before and after design in patients who had concussion and healthy controls. And um, interestingly in this study, if you uh, took more than 50 seconds to uh, do the test, you were much more likely to have been concussed than a healthy person. So sometimes it said that you need a baseline for the KD test, but in this study, uh, if you did it over, over 50 seconds as opposed to less, you were more likely to be concussed. And then um, when we looked at these repetitive saccades like Tina showed you, uh, those who had abnormal saccades took longer to complete the pre-exercise KD test than the um, controls with, or the concussed with uh, normal repetitive saccades. So if you had abnormalities on the saccadic examination, you didn't do as well on the KD test. Um, and the, the, main, the main finding of the study was that if I give you a KD test separated by 15 minutes, you'll do faster on the second one because of the learning effect. But in this case, when we inter, interposed exercise and there was no learning effect or they got worse, they took significantly longer to recover than the patients who demonstrated the normal learning effect. So lack of improvement on KD test performance after a standardized exercise test may be an uh, indicator of delayed recovery from sport-related concussion. So again, we're trying to combine physiological tests here to give us a little more information. Okay, you probably have guessed that you shouldn't be cocooning in, in 2022. Why? Well, it doesn't work. What's the evidence? Uh, randomized control trial. Uh, almost 100 patients seen in a pediatric ER within 24 hours were randomized to five days of strict rest versus sort of usual care, one to two days followed by stepwise return. Uh, most of them completed all the um, study procedures. And what you show, uh, what this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve shows that uh, is that the, um, uh, there were no, well, this is, there were no differences in neurocognitive balance outcomes, but the intervention group that was advised to strictly rest for the five days had more symptoms than the usual care group and, and slower symptom resolution. So this study showed in a nice, very nice design, again, when you're evaluating concussion treatments, I I urge you to try to look at the highest level evidence studies, you know, level one and level two, or randomized trials, good cohort studies to give us the best information. And this was good information that strict rest really didn't um, help these patients recover. Ah, here's another one. Um, if you can get to them early on, like in Dr. Masters' ER, you can uh, really improve their uh, outcome over the following week if you tell them to limit screen activity within that first 48 hours. The evidence came from Dr. Mannix's group in Boston and was published last year where they looked at kids um, and young adults who were seen within 24 hours and they randomized them to a screen time permitted group or screen time restricted or abstinent group for 48 hours. And again, you see this Kaplan-Meier cur curve in terms of symptom resolution versus um, uh, re number of patients uh, remaining. And the screen time abstinent group um, uh, recovered much faster than the screen time permitted group. Um, uh, the difference was uh, eight versus three and a half days. Um, so that's a pretty good effect for, by just doing one thing, one simple thing. Now the screen time permitted group, uh, we're on the screen 630 minutes during the period compared to 130 in the abstinent group. So this is not a group that's putting their phones away, but 
they're really limiting it to about a fifth of what the others did. And it makes sense because the cognitive and visual problems that Dr. Master talked about are really aggravated by phones. So if you can get to kids early enough and, and have them you know, cut back on that in the first week, I think that's one evidence-based way we can help our patients recover. I do this a lot, uh, identify and stay below your cognitive and physical symptom exacerbation thresholds. Um, and for schoolwork, we, we talk about schedule breaks. Tina mentioned that. Why they might be helpful. Um, this was a prospective study of a bunch of kids that found those who were in the highest quartile of cognitive activity uh, shortly after concussion, they experienced a longer duration of symptoms. So these were kids who were probably going back to school the next day or when they were very symptomatic. And I found that that really aggravates their uh, concussive symptoms. Uh, we did a small study a couple of years ago where uh, there was an association between the number of hours a student spent in school each day after concussion and, da and daily symptom level reports. So again, we don't want to keep kids out of school, but we do have to pay attention to high cognitive loads immediately uh, after the injury. Um, we also did a preliminary uh, study here on uh, cognitive intolerance and neuroimaging uh, published two years ago. And what we found was um, much like uh, we talk about exercise intolerance, we have to start thinking about cognitive intolerance, okay? Um, so this is really, um, we see this sometimes after kids even return to uh, sports, okay? They're, they're sort of uh, getting uh, cognitively uh, fatigued as the school day goes on. And again, it's a different type of, of blood flow control probably. And it's something that um, we, we may want to uh, consider with uh, even cognitive rehabilitation if it persists. But remember that, that cognitive intolerance, they're getting tired as um, the day goes on and they just can't think well uh, by the end of the school day. Okay, um, start low level aerobic activity as soon as possible after 40 hours from injury. Um, this has sort of uh, been a mantra of our group for a while, uh, that as soon as the concussion symptoms are stabilizing, don't be afraid to get them at least into some physical activity. Um, what's the evidence? Uh, this was the first uh, randomized trial we published uh, in 2019, where we have um, almost half the cohort was, was male, a uh, female, which was nice. We randomized uh, them to either aerobic exercise or a placebo stretching condition. And um, they were seen within five days of their injury. So they're actively symptomatic. You see their PCSS scores are moderately symptomatic. So these are not recovered kids. And uh, what you see in this Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, again, think of the uh, vertical axis as the one, how many are remaining concussed versus time. And you see after about a week, the aerobic exercise group starts to separate out and recovers faster than the stretching group. Um, the difference was about four days, 17 versus 13. That was statistically uh, significant. We did not find a significant effect on preventing prolonged symptoms, however, and that's defined as symptoms more than a month in adolescence. The good news was that females responded as well as males. So, you know, there are studies out there saying females have more symptoms, they take longer to recover. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that, that's all in people who are not even treated. Turns out if you treat females like males, guess what? They recover just as well. So no sexism in concussion care, okay? Now, I told you um, that we didn't show a difference in uh, the rate of PPCS. Now, if you tell concussed adolescents to go home and just rest and do nothing, and a month later you, you talk to them, you'll find that one third are symptomatic. This is from the great Roger Zemeckis group in Canada the largest pediatric concussion study in the world. In our uh, placebo stretching group in the study uh, above there, 15% of them went on to have delayed recovery, but only 5% in the aerobic group, but this was not statistically significant. So uh, luckily the AMSSM was dumb enough to give us a, a grant back in 2017. Um, and <laughs> thanks to Dr. Master uh, mainly and her group, we completed it. Um, and we kind of replicated the one I just showed you. Um, but we did a few other things. We had more um, uh, sort of uh, more severely injured kids involved by including clinics at Dr. Master's group and Dr. Mannix's group at Harvard. Uh, they tend to see, I think, more uh, symptomatic concussed patients. And anyway, we did the same design, randomized them to exercise or placebo stretching. And uh, in this group, we had a lot more of them who had a delayed recovery, 21% in the aerobic exercise and about a third in the stretching had not recovered by day 29. 
And then when we looked at the survival analysis and we controlled for sex time and, and mean daily exercise time, the hazard ratio, HR here means hazard ratio, not heart rate, for developing PPCS was um, only 0.52. That is, there was a 48% reduction in uh, the number of kids who went on to have a delayed recovery uh, in the group that was randomized to aerobic exercise versus uh, stretching. So this is the first study to show that an early intervention, maybe we're, remember we're doing this within five to six days of their injury, actually prevented a significant amount of them, about half of them from having that delayed recovery, which for your adolescents is the worst situation because those are the ones that really have trouble with getting back to school and sports and they get depressed. That's the difference there in terms of uh, the 28, uh, 29 day um, incidence of PPCS. Now, that was what's called an intent to treat analysis in which everybody who's randomized is analyzed, even if they don't complete the program. And guess what? Some adolescents don't complete the program. Now, if we look at those who actually completed the program and who adhered to their prescription, um, we get a different story, or a little better story. And, and the nice part about this study is we had objective confirmation from heart rate data during exercise that they actually did what they said they, uh, or what they were assigned to do. And so if you were adherent, you recovered in 12 days versus uh, 21 days who did their stretching. So about uh, close to half the time, that's a big difference clinically and statistically. And only 9% in the adherent exercise group had PPCS, whereas still about a third of the stretching did. So uh, again, a big difference here. No adverse events or near misses. So the key here is that early individualized aerobic exercise safely reduced recovery time and even better if they were adherent to their prescription. So future studies may wanna evaluate how to make adolescents more adherent. Another thing we looked at, um, Many of the things you saw from Dr. Master's talk were the physical signs of concussion. Well, most concussions are measured by symptoms, right? But you can also look at physical signs, which are more objective. And we looked at the effect of exercise on the physical signs of concussion. We combined the two RCTs I just showed you. And we looked at, again, the incidence of PPCS, uh, taking longer than 28 days or 29 days to recover. We had uh, more subjects in, in this um, co uh, study. And we separated the groups, uh, and this is arbitrary, but mild was three or fewer abnormal physical exam findings that Dr. Master outlined and moderate was four or more. And if you look at the survival analysis curve and concentrate on these two upper ones here, you see that the aerobic exercise uh, worked even better in the kids who had more physical signs of concussion. Now, remember we said earlier that if you have somebody in the first week who's got four or five visual or vestibular signs, they are very likely to take a longer time to recover. Well, in this study, if you got aerobic exercise as opposed to stretching, uh, you were much more likely to recover in a normal time frame um, uh, with exercise than um, with the stretching placebo group. So um, it even seems to work in those who have uh, uh, more signs of concussion as well as more symptoms. But the key here is getting them early. How soon can you exercise after a sport-related concussion? Uh, these uh, are the first and the, uh, the AMSSM is the second RCT. And what you look here is we instituted this, uh, a mean of five versus six days in each study, but the range was one to 10 in the first and two to 10 days in the second. So again, the means four to, four to five, five to six rather, but we had some kids who were doing this at two to three days, some who were doing it at nine or 10 days. And um, it, it appears to work, work equally well uh, whether you do it earlier on or a little later on. But the key is to get it, it early before they're having persistent symptoms. So how soon is safe? 48 hours after injury, provided your symptoms are stable and less than seven out of 10, that is seven out of 10, not for each individual symptom, but how they're feeling sort of generally. If someone's really not feeling well, uh, we don't do this. You don't want to push them into symptom exacerbation. And we've had no uh, adverse events in two moderately large randomized trials. Um, I've taken a calling it, and I think Tina probably does too, mild symptom exacerbation exercise. This is really not symptom-free exercise. It's the, it's the point that uh, nobody um, is going to be symptom-free early on, and if you exercise, you're going to get some symptoms. The, the idea is to not let those symptoms get beyond mild. Once they do, they're instructed to stop. But mild's okay, and we use that as uh, two or uh, uh, two or less points uh, on the VAS, uh, the visual analog scale, compared to their pre-testing value as they get the exercise, if they get to three or more, 
and instructed to stop. Um, and it looks like the more you do, especially in that first week, and regardless of severity, that is more symptoms and more uh, physical examination signs, the faster you recover. So we were concerned that in the past that maybe it was only the ones who were feeling good enough to exercise that actually got the benefit of it. They're the only ones who would do it. Turns out it's the ones who have more severe concussions by signs and symptoms that appear to be more motivated to do this and they actually recover faster if they're adherent to it. Uh, the other um, thing I want to encourage you to do is uh, identify and treat a cervical injury right away. Um, part of our concussion physical examination includes the neck. Why is that? Because it works. Um, and there's systematic reviews showing that um, there's a large prevalence of uh, concussion, uh, neck related symptoms uh, in uh, acutely concussed and in post concussion patients. Um, and again, if you have neck pain uh, early on and you do nothing about it, you're more likely to have a delayed recovery. So, um, you can, you can identify symptoms with these different um, uh, inventories, dizziness, handicap, uh, neck disability index, et cetera, but we just ask them about it. And uh, if you use uh, manual physical therapies, you can reduce uh, time to symptom resolution after concussion and uh, speed medical clearance. Um, I won't go into this, but we published an RDR, risk of delayed recovery score in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last year. And um, uh, we identified several, uh, factors for the development of PPCS, but cervical injury was not one of them. And I think because in our cohort, we treat it as soon as we see it. Um, so something to think about. Um, now, in terms of uh, what Tina was saying, in terms of vestibular uh, rehabilitation, um, I uh, used to just wait for a while until that wasn't getting better. And what does a while mean? Well, it, it, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, but, um, you know, I'm starting to pay attention to the evidence and I'm, I'm starting to introduce this earlier on in, uh, uh, in treatment. And it seems like it works. Uh, the Pittsburgh group did a randomized trial. Um, and I won't go through this for time reasons in great detail, but they basically um, took kids who had vestibular signs and symptoms. Uh, and the mean time to uh, uh, symptom evaluation was six days and they randomized them to um, vestibular exercises or sort of behavioral intervention, which included advice about physical activity and moderating your uh, sleep and hydration, et cetera. And they did it for four weeks. And what they found was the vestibular intervention group, again, this is done within a week or two of, of concussion, recovered their uh, VOMS abnormalities significantly faster than the group that did not get any vestibular rehabilitation. Now, both groups recovered from their concussion in the same amount of time. They didn't speed overall recovery, but they did improve this, um, the abnormalities that they identified on, on Dr. Master's visio vestibular exam. So there's, this is a randomized trial. So um, again, getting toward level one evidence that earlier introduction of vestibular therapy and those who have these multiple deficits may be useful. The other thing is get them in soon. I assume you guys are mostly working in concussion sports or sports medicine centers. And one of the tenets of sports medicine is rapid uh, uh, evaluation. Why is that? Again, the, the, the Pittsburgh group showed that um, when we uh, look at this, they looked at this retrospectively, those that were seen within seven days versus later had different outcomes. Um, and so being in the Lake group, you had a, almost six uh, odds ratio of six of having a recovery time greater than uh, 30 days. Those who were seen within a week recovered in 20 days faster than those who were seen two to three weeks after injury. And this is my experience too. The faster you get them in assessed and treated, the faster they recover. And maybe because we're getting earlier active rehabilitation strategies that are controlled by the physician, um, and without guidance, you know, athletes may push too hard uh, and they may actually delay their recovery. This is why it's important that uh, the, the activity we give them is, is controlled and, and guided to some, in some way, that we just don't tell them to go out and exercise. We try to establish some sort of heart rate threshold uh, whenever we can. Um, I'm getting to the end here, I think. Uh, the other thing is see the patient weekly for up to four weeks. Um, this may sound kind of, uh, you know, obvious to some or, or crazy to others, but it's good clinical practice. And the evidence is that in those two randomized trials I discussed, um, it seemed to help. 
So in both of those trials, uh, we actually saw them weekly and assessed their symptoms, physical exam, and uh, response to exercise tolerance. And if they had a normal examination, uh, a normal visio-vestibular exam and normal exercise tolerance, we actually went back to the day that they were reporting that their symptoms were gone. And that was their day of, of clinical recovery. And what it means is that you can get your athletes back faster this way uh, because you're, you're more likely to catch them when they're clinically recovered than if you're seeing them every two to three to four weeks. So I think I'm going to um, stop there because we're out of time and um, probably leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you both so much. That was phenomenal. Um, I can definitely speak for everyone in saying that we really appreciate you guys presenting your research and um, that was very informative. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat that I can read out for you guys, if that's okay. Sure. So the first one we have is, um, are there some specific at-home routines um, you could suggest for patients to help with the visual tracking? Yeah, I tried to respond to Tom in uh, the text in the chat that we would um, discuss this a little bit. I, we do actually have uh, what we would describe as a home visio vestibular exercise program that is essentially like the entry level uh, vestibular visual physical therapy or occupational therapy that you would do if you got formally referred. And so what we've done is just essentially adapt those initial exercises and we have our kids do them actually fairly early on in the uh, post-injury process. Process. And so um, they involve essentially uh, replicating what we do in the exam in terms of horizontal and vertical saccades and the horizontal and vertical angular vestibular ocular reflex, as well as um, right. convergence and accommodation. And so it's essentially um, uh, along those lines. And we do have kids do those. Um, and we do think that it has um, a positive benefit. Um, that's something that we're looking at right now actively in terms of some of our research to actually see if we can um, make a direct uh, line connection in terms of of um, whether or not it's helpful or not, but we do do that um, uh, as sort of a pre, um, you know, referral to rehab. Um, and so that's how we approach it with our kids. Just to follow up on that, I guess the question is, do you have um, those resources available for, you know, a community clinician where they could find them? Yeah, absolutely. We can share our home exercise instructions. Mm -hmm. All right. And then our second question, I'll pull it up. So this one's for Dr. Letty. Um, any advice on how to guide athletes through recovery when you don't have an exercise test and you don't know the heart rate at which symptoms are exacerbated? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, we're, um, it's funny you should say that, we're preparing a practical management paper for CJSM on that very topic <laughs> and hope to submit it within a, a week or two. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, if you don't have an exercise test and you don't know the heart rate, um, basically you can kind of do this on your own. Um, but I tell people, um, again, once once it's been 48 hours or so, uh, to uh, pick what they like, whether that's walking outside or riding a stationary bike, something that, you know, again, uh, won't activate their vestibular system too much. And um, try to do uh, something lightly for 20 minutes and just use uh, this principle of symptom exacerbation. So grade your symptoms before you start. Oh, I feel like a three today. And if you're walking or jogging or riding the bike and you go up to five or six, uh, then stop. Okay. And then um, uh, whether that's five minutes in or 50 minutes in, uh, we really don't. And I learned this from the CHOP group. Um, we used to tell them, you know, after 20 minutes, stop. But, but clearly, um, the, from a practical experience in Philadelphia and now in Buffalo and from our research, the more you do early on appears to be um, uh, beneficial, okay? So it, it, as long as you're following that guide of don't let your symptoms go up more than two or three points compared to your starting symptoms, you can do as much as you want, uh, actually. And if you want to do more, that's actually, I think, better. Um, we just had a paper come out in MSSE that showed that. The more you did early on, despite your symptoms, uh, the faster you recovered. So um, it's, it's, it's really the principle of identify your threshold, stay below it, but do as much below your threshold as you can on a regular basis. 
Um, if you have a bad day, don't worry about it. You go back and do it the next day. You know, this works best in an athletic setting when you can identify that heart rate threshold and give them a specific prescription, but not everybody can do that. And um, the practical management paper we'll have coming out uh, probably within, you know, the next several months will really help uh, people do that. Uh, we give them a form uh, to help them follow it along too. So stay tuned for that. And just to follow up, that was um, a threshold of three on the best, correct? Is what you were saying? Uh, the, yeah, on the VAS. So again, uh, VAS, uh, visual analog sales. So again, I, if I feel like I'm a, you know, my symptoms are kind of three out of 10 right now and I'm, I'm 15 minutes into exercise and now I'm feeling like I'm up five going to a six, that's the signal to stop. If I'm staying at a one or, uh, I'm sorry, a four or a five, which is only one or two points different, you can keep going for 20, 30, 40 minutes if you want. Yeah, we usually tell our kids to just follow the two point rule, you know, not go above beyond two points of where they started. And so that was sort of our poor man's version that we were doing at CHOP um, because we didn't have the great setup that John has where he exercise tests everybody. I guess for your community, you know, clinician um, that might not be able to follow up really closely with these, um, you know, athletes, these young athletes in high school, I think about too. This yeah. could be maybe something that you essentially kind of train the athletic trainers who are there on the day to day with them that they can help manage. Yep, exactly. And that's what we've done with all of our local schools. Awesome. That's yep, that's what you do. Let the athletic trainer do it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And then we have another question in chat. It's a three part question. So, um, this person is asking, so the literature reports that the majority of individuals recover from concussion within the seven to 10 days. Uh, the consensus is that the concussion symptoms arise as a result of the neurometabolic cascade that is reversible. Um, given this understanding, that they have three questions. One is how soon were these patients evaluated following their inju uh, injury? Uh, two was what is the recommended strategies for care for the patients who continue to complain? Um, of persistent symptoms months after this inciting event. And then the last one is, um, has prophylactic neck strengthening been established? I know you, you talked about the cervical um, spine and, and making sure that you're addressing that. Um, but I guess this individual is asking about the neck strengthening. Has it been established um, as a strategy? Tina, there's some evidence that it works now. Um, yeah. Correct? There's some good evidence with regard to the cervical on neck training that it actually does reduce your um, experience of forces. So when they've done actual mechanical studies to see what uh, mechanical forces are experienced, um, that is uh, reduced. Um, and it does look like it actually also um, may uh, be helpful in reducing the risk of concussion. So um, neck strengthening is one thing that does appear to be um, something that is a good preventative approach. With respect to the other questions, uh, if, if he's asking about my studies, they were seen within a week of, of injury. So early on while they were symptomatic. Now he's right, or he, he or she is right. The metabolic cascade is over within uh, hours to days um, after injury. And um, the thinking is that uh, this seven day recovery period may be for elite college athletes, but for most adolescents, if you don't do anything, it's not seven to 10 days. Um, and most adults, it's, it's more like uh, three to four weeks. Um, in yeah. patients who have symptoms beyond that, okay, we call that persistent symptoms. Um, the, the thinking now is that the actual uh, metabolic crisis that we think of concussion as abnormal autonomic function and or abnormal control of cerebral blood flow is actually gone by that. Uh, or it's not, it's not the primary producer of symptoms. What you are left with is Dr. Masters' persistent vestibular vision problems, an unrecognized neck injury, an exacerbation of an anxiety or migraine headache phenomenon. You were left with a, um, an associated injury that happened at the time of concussion, but the concussion is the way I uh, conceptualize it is actually over. And if you want to kind of confirm that in your mind, it, the, the data show that if you exercise test these people, they generally have good exercise tolerance uh, as opposed to in the acute phase when they never do. So we say your concussion is over, but your ocular motor injury is not at this point. And you need to get into vision therapy or vestibular therapy or both or you need to see a psychologist, or you need a cognitive uh, therapist at this point, uh, or you need a, a migraine medication. So the, the pathophysiology of persistent symptoms is different 
than the pathophysiology of acute concussion. And I, 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 that's an, we didn't really talk about that because that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> um, but as, as, as Dr. Master knows, this is the key to evaluating and treating these patients. You, you have to get out of your mind that they, they're still concussed. They are not. Yeah, I think that the way to think about it really is that um, the mechanical um, injury um, sets off, you know, this neural metabolic cascade, but that's just the first step and that there's downstream um, uh, things that occur later that we are still, everybody, the group or the field is still working out in terms of what's involved in terms of, you know, inflammation or diffuse axonal injury um, as the different processes that sort of perpetuate after the neural metabolic cascade resolves. And so I guess a couple of things I would also throw out there too, is that actually uh, from the CARE Consortium study, which was the largest um, cohort study of collegiate athletes, D1 through D3, uh, with 31 colleges across the country, um, we were uh, lucky to be a part of that at the University of Pennsylvania. What they found is actually, even in that level um, of relatively elite athlete, it was on the order of four, three to four weeks for normal recovery for um, those athletes. And so that's really um, a changing move moving from the seven to 10 days to three to four weeks, as John had indicated. And then from the standpoint of the recommended strategies, it's exactly um, what um, you know, John said. I think you wanna start looking at what are the particular manifestations. It can be multi-domain. So the important thing is to assess all the domains and not just sort of say, oh, you've got one or the other. Um, make sure you're covering all your bases and what are those domains then target those domains. And what we found is that uh, vestibular and visual are two very um, uh, commonly affected domains that um, result in persisting symptoms. And the great news is that those are essentially neuromuscular um, systems uh, that can be actually um, trained and rehabbed back. And so there is hope. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, the best news um, from that standpoint. Yeah. And I, I just add that um, be rehabilitation heavy in your treatment of concussion patients and, and medication judicious. Yes. I echo that 100%. And to, to give a big plug for John's work on exercise, we like to think about exercise as the rising tide that lifts all ships, right? So exercise makes everything better. Um, and not to just sound like dumb jocks who like sports medicine, you know, um, exercise makes everything better in concussion, you know? Uh, and so I think from that standpoint, in the right amount, in the right time, in the right, you know, dose, um, but um, in general, that is going to be the principle that you're going to want to work with. And that'll be really um, good for your patients. Okay, and I think we don't see any other questions in the chat. I had a question um, that I wanted to ask you guys. So uh, what are some important things that you have to keep in mind um, when you're a sports medicine phys physician faced with the prospect of potentially um, having an athlete retire from their sport due to concussion? And how do you approach that and what... Um, because there's not really a set criteria, right? It's a decision with the athlete. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on how you approach, um, you know, a scenario like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> That's a great question and it's not an easy question, but I think just you actually highlighted, you know, one aspect that is really important, which is that because it's an area where we have incomplete understanding, uh, we don't have all the answers, we don't have all the data, we're still working a lot of things out. It is an area that's really um, prime for shared decision making, right? And so I think it is important to make sure that we take into account, um, you know, everything that we do know um, and how to make a decision in that context. Context. And usually with our families, and you can imagine in like the pediatric setting, um, that's a very hard decision in the pediatric setting, you know, because, you, you know, we don't take that really lightly. And in general, uh, in kids, there's a way of, you know, redirecting to other sports, you know, hopefully or other activities that, you know, they can channel their energies towards. But um, I think that more and more, it ends up being a combination of if you're getting uh, multiple injuries, and again, there's no magic number. It's not like three strikes and you're out. Life is not baseball. Uh, but but, you know, we do start to become worried, you know, if you are racking them up, 
if you are having longer recoveries, um, you're not really making it back to your pre-injury um, you know, state of function. Um, and usually, you know, over time, especially if you're taking a very rehabilitative approach that's optimistic to get them back to where you want them to get back to, that if it's taking them a long time to get back to that, or they don't get back to where they'd like to be, um, we usually aren't telling people they have to retire. They have made that decision on their own. Um, and so I think that that's sort of how um, it works out well in terms of uh, as a sports medicine physician, walking alongside your athlete and supporting them and helping them with the information um, to make the decisions themselves. Um, and so it's rare that we're imposing an externally um, made decision, um, but we usually arrive at it together that way. Yeah, uh, not much to add. It's really the pattern uh, of concussions. Um, uh, one, one key is reducing uh, or, or lesser force that's producing concussions, things like that. Um, they're losing their concussion reserve. I talk about that when sort of having this discussion and uh, Tina's right, there's no magic number. I've counseled patients who had one severe concussion that they probably should avoid contact sports um, and, and then others who've had 20. So it, it's really, it depends on the patient, obviously. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much. And I know that we're running out of time. Um, we did have one, one more question, if you guys don't mind. Um, it was from the medical student interest group. We were just curious about, um, you know, what brought you into the field and um, what, you know, how you got, got started in con concussion specifically. Um, as we know, you guys, that's your area of expertise. Go ahead, John. Well, I, I, I got kicked out of every other field, so I, I only have this one. Um, well, I, I guess the short answer is I, I'm an internal medicine doctor by original training, and then I did sports. And um, in the 90s, I was covering uh, U, UB football games on the sidelines and all sports, seeing lots of concussions, and we didn't really know what to do with them back then. And then Dr. Willer, who some of you may know the name, he's my mentor and colleague here at uh, UB. He's a world-renowned uh, TBI expert, and he got interested in concussion because he's Canadian um, and hockey. And anyway, um, he came down one day and, and asked me if I'd be interested. And I said, sure, yeah, I'm seeing these all the time. And we started talking about them. And neither of us is a neurologist um, or a brain doctor, right? But uh, we started taking a, a sort of sports medicine, physiological, behavioral medicine approach to concussion. Uh, and that's how we landed on um, exercise and things like that, because I was just seeing a, a number of athletes who were just getting worse with, with me telling them to do nothing. And, and sports medicine doctors are, like I said, an early specific diagnosis and early targeted rehabilitation. That's what sports medicine is. If you're not into that, then you shouldn't be in the field. And concussion for decades was, <laughs> wait till the symptoms go away completely, as if life is symptom-free. And you know it just wasn't working. So uh, that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. That's an awesome story. I love it. And so, um, you know, our little connection and my minor claim to fame is that I went to med school actually in Buffalo, but it was before John had come back. And so it was in the really, really early nineties. And so um, I actually spent the first 17 years of my career as an academic general pediatrician. So I was the vice program director for the residency program and was a primary care pediatrician. Um, got interested in concussion actually uh, because my oldest son, who's now 23, but when he was five, one of his early uh, youth ice hockey coaches was Keith Primo, who retired from the NHL from concussion, and we became friends. And I remember thinking in the early, um, you know, to mid 2000s, how I was just amazed that we still had not made as much progress as I would have hoped in terms of the diagnosis and treatment of concussion. And so I went back and did my sports medicine fellowship at Penn, and then helped start the sports medicine fellowship at CHOM, um, and then basically, you know, went from there in terms of um, being uh, interested in concussion, both from a clinical standpoint. Um, and really honestly did not plan on doing research at all. I planned to be primarily a clinician, but I think I was just struck with how many questions my patients were asking me that I did not have good answers to. <laughs> and so that's really where I would say any good research question I ever had, I got from my patients. And so that's really what kind of drove me to do research. And it's been great being able to do the translational piece, you know, get my kids uh, answers to their questions um, and hopefully uh, move the field forward that way. 
Thank you so much for sharing. That's amazing. And she it, has done it's, that. it's absolutely true. I even think about, because I grew up playing hockey in Canada. And even I when I was younger. Hockey, I see the hockey sticks in the corner. <laughs> I, I, still, I still play, but I think about, I got a concussion when I was young and, you know, that wasn't that long ago. And that was back when you're like sleep all day, stay in the dark, not like light, no lights on. And yeah. it's yeah. just interesting how much it's changed. Yeah. And it's, you know, thank you. And I would just, you know, for everyone on this call, I, one thing I, I like to tell uh, students and stuff is organize your curiosity. And that's what Dr. Master did. So uh, if you organize your curiosity, it'll lead you down, hopefully, to work with people who know something about research and you can become a, a clinician researcher. And I think the combination is very nice because pure researchers are great, but clinicians bring uh, the patient perspective, uh, which is important, especially in something like concussion because it's so uh, nonspecific and protean and there's so many different aspects to it. Um, you know, without, without the clinician perspective, I think, I think you're missing something. So I encourage you all, if, if it doesn't have to be concussion, but if you find something that you're curious about in your clinician, you can usually uh, find somebody who, who can help you, uh, again, organize that and systematically assess uh, a, a clinical question you have. And that, that may lead you into a, a career or a part of your career. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. That was amazing and really appreciate all your perspectives. Um, and yeah, every I think everyone here can walk away from this um, feeling like we know concussions a little bit more. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. I'm always happy to be Tina's intern. Oh, stop. <laughs> Definitely reach out with anything you need. Uh, good luck to you all. You guys are uh, going into a fantastic field. It's loads and loads of fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye.